Well, welcome everyone to Bible study. We're on Genesis chapter 15, and Mitzi's going to read that for us in a moment. But let's just open with a word of prayer. God, how we give you thanks and praise in your holy name for your word for your mighty holiness, your purity, your salvation, your grace, your love, your mercy are displayed all throughout scripture, even in the most difficult parts. But Lord, sometimes things don't go the way we want or hope. And yet, when we rely on you, you love us, you care for us, and you are interested in every detail of our lives. And so, God, tonight, we give you the server. We give you each one on it. And we ask, Lord God, that you would meet each need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We ask that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that you would open our mouths and our ears, God, that we would hear the words you have for us and help us to draw closer to you. Thank you for this opportunity to share your word together, to chew on the bread of life together because you have allowed it. Thank you for discord. Thank you for the bots we have, God. I know one of them had some severe problems, but I thank you and praise you, Lord God, for the dedication of all those who make our experience online possible, who protect us, God, and supply us with fun things. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor tonight. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, Mitzi, Genesis 15, please. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me, since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Ele Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look towards the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three year old heifer and a three year old female goat and a three year old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed oppressed 400 years, but I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite, and the Kadmonite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Rephim, 
and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. Thank you very much. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So, <clears throat> Joyce L. Gibson has written this, as I mentioned before. She's the, a curriculum writer for Wheaton College, where she was. And she tells us that Abram had rescued his nephew Lot from a raiding army that had carried him away. He had refused a reward from the king of Sodom, and now he was alone back at his camp. And I just want to say the reason what we studied earlier, the reason that he chose not to accept a reward is he did not want to look as though he was taking advantage of the situation. And God had made wonderful promises to Abram, but it seemed to him that the one most important promise had not been fulfilled. All other promises hinged on God's promise to give him a son. So how could God make a nation from Abram if he did not have a son? And as the months went by, it seemed more and more unlikely that Sarai would ever give birth to a child. However, in spite of the apparent impossibility of ever having had a son, Abram believed God. And we learn from Genesis 15 how God viewed his faith and confirmed the promise he had made when he first called Abram to his adventure and faith in Genesis 12. She says, God's timing is perfect, and we know that. <clears throat> Many of us have experienced that. He knew when Abram's heart was particularly sore, when his faith needed reassurance, and when he was ready for God to make himself known in yet another facet of his love and care for Abram. And we read in Genesis 15, 1, the big picture is after Abram's dramatic rescue of Lot, God spoke to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now see here, Abram is a hero, but he's also human. And we see him perhaps feeling let down after the challenges he had overcome in his daring rescue of Lot. Perhaps he feared that the kings of the east might target him in retaliation for his attack on them. And he had done right by refusing to accept the rewards offered by the king of Sodom, but in doing so, he had missed out on sizable wealth. But God knew Abram's heart and he spoke to him in a vision. He assured Abram in the two areas he felt need. God confirmed that he himself was Abram's protection or shield. And, he, and that actually is mentioned in 2 Samuel 22, 31, Psalm 28, 7, and Proverbs 30, verse 5, the word shield. And he also confirmed that far more than any material reward, he himself was Abram's exceedingly great reward in Genesis 15, 1. You see, no matter what was happening in Abram's life, God was at the center, the center of Abram's activity, his plans, and his hopes. What a wonderful promise to think that God is at the center of our activity, our plans, and our hopes. That just, it's mind-boggling to me. Lloyd Ogilvie wrote this. The Lord's constant word to us is fear not. There are 366 fear not verses in the Bible. One for every day of the year and an extra one for leap year, which, by the way, we have this year. Most of the admonitions are followed by a firm assurance that the Lord's presence or a stirring reminder of an aspect of his nature, like his faithfulness, goodness, loving kindness, or intervening power in times of need. Now, <clears throat> before we carry on, there's three definitions. A vision is a revelation from God received while in a dreamlike state. A tabernacle was a portable shelter as a tent that was used for worship. 
And for anyone who doesn't know, a missionary is a believer who traveled or travels often to other countries to give God's message. So Joyce tells us, from time to time, God spoke to people, usually prophets, in a vision. And here's some examples. Jacob, Abram's grandson in Genesis 46, 2. Samuel, a boy serving the priest Eli in the tabernacle in 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 18. Ezekiel, a priest who prophesied while in exile in Babylon in Ezekiel 1, 1. Daniel, a captive in Babylon who became God's prophet in Daniel 10, 7. Zechariah, a priest serving in the temple in Luke 1, 22. Ananias, a believer in the early church in Acts 9, 10, and Saul, a new convert in Acts 9, 5, or sorry, Acts 9, 12. Peter, a leader in the early church in Acts 10, 9 to 23. And Paul, a missionary and leader in the early church in Acts 18, 9. Just one moment, please. So in Genesis 15, 2 to 6, the big picture is this. Abram asked about the promised reward. What would God give him since he was without a son? When Abram died, his heir would be his servant, Eleazar. But God promised that Eleazar would not be the heir since Abram was going to have a son. And to confirm the promise, God took Abram out to look at the sky for his offspring would number with the stars. Abram believed the Lord and the Lord credited Abram's faith to him as righteousness. So Joyce tells us God had promised to be Abram's reward, but what would that reward be? Abram raised a troubling question. What Abram longed for was a son, but no son had come since God had promised to make a nation of Abram's descendants. Abram yearned with all his heart to probe God's plan for him, and he wondered why God had not kept his promise to give him a son. Now, according to custom, if Abram died without a son to be his heir, his servant Eleazar would receive the inheritance. And it is probable that Eleazar was Abram's chief of staff or had been given the status of an adopted son and had been trusted to serve as a member of the family. Did God intend to fulfill his promise through Abram's servant? But God left no doubt in Abram's mind as he said, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir in Genesis 15.4. And to make his promise even more clear, God took Abram outdoors where he could gaze at the night sky. He told Abram to look up and in Genesis 15, 5, count the stars if you were able to number them. Of course, Abram could not count all the stars that glittered overhead. God promised that Abram's descendants would become so multiplied that they could not be counted either. And Abram's heart responded. He believed God. Genesis 15, 6 tells us that Abram believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. The Experience in God Study Bible says, God honored the boldness and confidence Abram showed in asking God hard questions. Elizabeth Elliot wrote, when we are stalling over some difficult decision or hesitating to make an affirmation, Faith comes in to strengthen and encourage us, but faith's object is dim to our human eyes. In the face of obscurities, Jesus is saying, trust me. Grace then is given, which confirms our will and helps us toward a faith which can rest with the unexplained. So before we continue, sin the definition of sin they give is a wrongdoing that falls short of God's holy standard of perfection. And righteousness is not sinlessness, but counted as sinless in God's eyes. Think about that. Righteousness is not sinlessness, but it is counted as sinless 
in God's eyes. So Joyce tells us God is righteous. He is morally right in every way. Abram could not claim to be righteous for like every person born into the human race, he had done wrong. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God calls this wrongdoing sin. But Abram believed God and God credited his faith as righteousness. Though what Abram believed is not clear in Genesis 15, his actions indicate that he believed that God was his protector, his reward, would give him a son, and would give him descendants that would become a great nation of many people. And quite frankly, we can learn a lot from Abram's response to God by looking at other passages of, in the Bible where Genesis 15, 6 is explained. So there's two. In Romans 4, Abraham, as he was later called, obeyed rules that God gave, but those rules came after God accredited Abram's faith as righteous. Therefore, obeying God's laws does not earn credit for righteousness. Rather, even when faced with the fact that he and Sarah, as she were late, was later called, were old, Abram did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Verses 20 to 24 of Romans Galatians 3 6 to 9. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for his righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Abraham's faith encompassed more than we might think. Through these verses in Galatians, God tells us that when Abraham believed God, he was believing that God would provide justification, not only for himself and for the nation God had promised to come before him, but also for the Gentiles. The Gentiles meant non-Jewish people. And justification was God's declaration of innocence. I've heard this term just as if I'd never. <clears throat> and that's kind of the explanation they give here. And this means that anyone who has faith as Abram did will be blessed as Abram was. Abram was declared righteous not because he was perfect, but because he believed God. So God's favor communicated to a person or people is blessed. So James Montgomery Boyce wrote this. Genesis 15, 6 is one of the most important verses, if not the most important verses in the entire Bible. For it tells for the first time how a sinful man or woman may become right with God. In ourselves, we are not right with God. We are alienated from him by our sinful natures and by deliberate sinful choices. We are under God's wrath, and apart from him, we are destined to perish miserably. If it is possible that we can become right with God once again, as this verse says we can, thereby passing from sin to holiness and from wrath to blessing, this is clearly great news, and the verse that tells us how this can happen is of supreme importance. So let's stop for a moment. <clears throat> let's see if anyone has any comments or questions. So we'll continue on with Genesis 15 verses 7 through 21 and this is the big picture. So God spoke to Abram saying, I am the Lord who brought you out of year of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. This is verse 7, the New King James Version. And again, Abram raised a question. How could he know that he would gain possession of it? In a solemn ceremony, God revealed to Abram that in spite of mistreatment, his descendants would see his covenant promises fulfilled. You see, God and Abram had opened their hearts. 
God had given an assurance in Genesis 15, 1. And Abram had raised a question in verses 2 and 3, and God answered in verse 4. God had confirmed his covenant by giving Abram a never-to-be-forgotten experience of looking to the starry heavens and learning that indeed his offspring would be just as uncountable in verse 5. And in verse 6, Abram had responded by believing the Lord, and God credited this to him as righteousness. So it was fitting that this solemn encounter between God and Abram be culminated in a further act of confirming the covenant that God had made with Abram. God told Abram to bring a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Abram killed the animals, cut them in half, and arranged the halves on opposite sides. When vultures swooped down to eat the dead bodies, Abram drove them away. At sunset, <coughs> excuse me, Abram fell into a deep sleep. Through a thick and dreadful darkness, God spoke to Abram, saying that his descendants would be strangers in another country, enslaved and mistreated 400 years. God promised that he would punish the nation that enslaved the people and would see that they would leave with great possessions in Genesis 15, 14. And in the darkness, God revealed himself in the form of an image, a smoking fire pot and a torch. Abram watched in the darkness as two fiery objects moved between the pieces of the slain animals. This showed that God would judge the nations and fulfill the covenant promises he had made. Then God gave specific geographic details regarding the land he was giving Abram's descendants from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. God had answered Abram's question. In spite of pain and enslavement in another land, Abram's descendants would indeed have the land. He would not fail. He would keep his covenant with Abram. Dr. Larry Richards, who actually is the editor of all of these books, wrote this. Usually covenants were confirmed by both parties. This implied that each accepted obligations relating to carrying out the intentions the covenant expressed. How significant Abram's deep sleep becomes. God alone passed between the parts of the sacrificed beasts. Abram has no part in making the covenant, so nothing Abram does can cause it to be canceled. You and I contributed nothing to our salvation. Jesus did it all. All we must do, all we can do, is put our trust in God. He will keep his covenant promise to save us for Jesus' sake. Let me repeat that last part. You and I contributed nothing to our salvation. Jesus did it all. All we must do, all we can do, is put our trust in God. He will keep his covenant promise to save us for Jesus' sake. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we can go on living a life of sin. But it does mean that the only way that we are saved is because of God, because of Jesus, not us, not anything that we can say or do. <clears throat> so what distinguished Abram, this is Joyce now, what distinguished Abram was the eye of his faith. He could see beyond the here and now to what lay ahead in life with God after his body died. And I really like this in Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, and this is the New King James. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Amen and amen. So A.W. Tozer wrote this. As Abraham 
staggered, not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and was fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. So do we base our hope in God alone and hope against hope till the day breaks. We rest in what God is. I believe that this alone is true faith. Any faith that must be supported by the evidence of the senses is not real faith. Let me read that again. A.W. Tozer. As Abraham staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and was fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. So do we base our hope in God alone and hope against hope till the day breaks. We rest in what God is. I believe that this alone is true faith. Any faith that must be supported by the evidence of the senses is not real faith. Some pretty harsh words. So we'll carry on. Joyce says, because Abram believed God, he would forgo the security and pleasures of this world, knowing that a far greater security and far more pleasures lie ahead. Pretty tough. But that takes us literally to the end of chapter 15 of the book of Genesis. So I'll close in a word of prayer and then let's talk if anyone has any comments or questions. God, thank you. Thank you for pointing out to us that real faith is reliant upon you and that nothing we can say or do humanly can bring about that faith. I ask, Lord God, that you would build that faith in all of us, that we would open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to receive from you what you would have for us, Lord. And I pray, God, that as we continue to walk with you, that you would continue to grow us and encourage us and draw us closer to you. And I pray when struggles come, that we would just go and sit in your lap or lay on the floor prostrate before you, before your throne, Jesus, because you are worthy to be praised. We give you praise, glory, honor, and thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.